Okay, so in our last video on the economics of the environment, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, climate change specifically. We're going to talk about, you know, how much it will cost uh, in order to uh, fight climate change. And actually, you know, in a lot of ways, it's less than you would think about. And if you, you know, go back to that abatement curve that we talked about, a lot of the investments are up front, right? So we will have to spend a lot of resources in order to, uh, you know, change our you know, the way we heat our homes, the way we drive our cars, the way we farm, um, but uh, they pay back over time, a lot of them. And so the actual costs are actually, you know, less than we think about. And a lot of that, you know, has to do with uh, benefits of technological improvements. And so we'll, we'll look at some of that um, and put that into our model. And so that's where we're, we're going to start now. So, if we think about technological improvement, right, we thought about this in uh, the earlier chapters when we were thinking about production functions and we said, okay, technological improvements allow us to do more, get more output with fewer inputs, right? That's sort of the definition of an improvement in technology. Um, and in this case, you know, our output is quality of the environment. Um, and so a shift up in our feasible frontier does in fact allow us to you know, get a, a cleaner environment at a lower cost. And so that's what is going on, you know, here uh, in this graph is, you know, when we shift up from the old feasible frontier to the new feasible frontier, we get a whole lot more uh, options at lower cost, right? So in this case, based on our indifference curves, what we actually did was we spent even more um, in order to get a much cleaner environment. But if we had different indifference curves, we could have spent the same amount to still get a cleaner environment or even spent less to get a cleaner environment. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of these technological improvements just over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, in terms of solar panels, in terms of wind farms, in terms of electric cars. Um, and I would expect those to keep going. And, and one of the roles of the government can really be to provide the incentives uh, for private industry to continue to make those technological improvements, whether that's through, you know, different types of regulation, um, you know, things like, um, you know, providing, you know, requiring higher miles per gallon in cars, um, requiring a certain amount of electricity be generated through new renewable resources, et cetera. Or, you know, it can be through things like subsidies, right? Providing a subsidy to buy an electric car, providing a subsidy to change, you know, your oil burning furnace to a, a heat pump. Um, so those are different ways that the government can, you know, help shift up this feasible frontier. This is one example. This is just the cost of renewable energy production. And you can see, you know, it only goes to, you know, maybe 2009. Um, and really this has in uh, continued, right? For both solar and wind, uh, prices have fallen significantly. Um, and a lot of that is the learning by doing, right? And learning by doing requires the doing. So it's not like we can just wait, right? We can't just say, okay, things will get cheaper in 10 or 20 years. Um, it will only get cheaper if we are actually producing them. And so, you know, when we think about solar panels, we're not going to get better at creating solar panels unless people are actually buying solar panels and we're producing solar panels. Um, same with electrical cars, same with, you know, really anything that's going to uh, reduce carbon emissions. And so this is, this is a, again, another way that the government can um, provide an incentive is saying, okay, well, we have to have this number of, you know, electric cars on the road by this date or, or, you know, as a number of countries are doing, the UK and Japan saying, we're not going to allow any electrical cars to be sold um, after this date, right? And so that provides an incentive for firms to get these uh, electric cars into production um, and learn and get them cheaper, uh, which is generally what happens. Uh, another way is we can provide it, we can put a tax on, right? And so we can put a tax on the polluting industry. And this is really very similar to the Pigovian tax. Um, we saw this graph in chapter two, uh, although in that case, it was about substituting um, energy or coal for labor. Now we want to get rid of the coal, right? Because we realize that has a negative externality. 
um, and substitute in solar panels. And so one option for uh, the government in order to um, provide an incentive to produce those solar panels is to put a tax on the amount of coal produced. Um, and so that will shift out the ISO cost line and make other technologies uh, more competitive, right? And the idea is, I think the danger here is that the government puts a tax on um, and the other industry sort of assumes that that tax is going to stay and doesn't try to get cheaper and cheaper, right? And really what you want to do is you want to make sure there's enough competition so that, um, you know, we, we benefit from that competition in terms of lower and lower prices. We can also tax consumers, right? So, and, and really it doesn't matter whether you put the tax on producers or consumers, um, either way, it's going to reduce the amount that is, is bought. Remember that the tax basically goes, uh, depends on the elasticity of supply and demand. Um, this example is air travel, right? So air travel is, is definitely one of the, the polluting things in the world and, and one that we're not going to have a, an electric solution, a, a non-polluting solution anytime soon. Um, that said, it only is about 2% of the world's greenhouse gases. So it's something, but not a huge amount. Um, but so here's an example where you put um, a, a tax on airlines and or on air flight. And basically that is going to reduce your feasible set um, and encourage, you know, greater consumption of free time as opposed to, uh, I guess, air travel. Um, and, you know, I think that that makes a certain amount of sense, right? Air travel is something that we probably don't want to, we definitely don't want to ban, um, but we might want to limit it. Um, and we might want to encourage people, you know, to, you know, take the train, drive an electric car as opposed to flying. And if they do have to fly, um, you know, make it a little bit more expensive. So we do it a little bit less. One of the, one of the, uh, big problems in terms of modeling climate change is this idea of a, a tipping point. Um, and a, a tipping point is where you have a, um, a, a self-regulating process that gets out of whack. And so in this case, what we have is we're, we're trying to model uh, the amount of sea ice um, in the world. And so we have sea ice now in period T on the horizontal axis and sea ice in period uh, T plus one. And as long as we are, you know, getting, as long as that slope is less than one and say we're at point B, then we're at a high amount of sea ice. And, and if we have a little bit more sea ice in period T, we get a little bit less in period T plus one, or if we have a little bit less, then we get a little bit more. Um, but the problem is, is that once we get below a certain amount, then uh, positive feedback basically leads to less and less sea ice and, until we end up at this sort of bottom uh, peer, bottom equilibrium. Um, and, and that is, you know, that's one of the things that climate scientists are worried about, right? It's not just a, a linear process where it just, things get worse and worse, but as long as, once we stop, you know, things will sort of even out. And then if we can reduce carbon emissions even more, then they'll get better and better, right? They're worried that that's not the way that it's going to happen, that we're going to have this sort of disequilibrium process. Um, and we get to, you know, an unstable equilibrium, you know, so if we, if we shift our, our sea ice curve, our S curve, uh, to a point where that high ice equilibrium no longer is an equilibrium, right? It doesn't cross that 45 degree line. Um, then we only have this low sea ice uh, equilibrium um, and, and there's not much we can do, right? And then, then we get the rising sea levels and all the bad things that, that come with that. Um, and so this is obviously a major concern. And, and one of the reasons that we probably want to look at sort of the worst case scenario of climate change when we're thinking about the costs and benefits. Um, and if we take that worst case scenario, then it basically says, all right, we need to do everything we can right now in order to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
So we've talked about some of these challenges already, right? Is that um, for one thing, people are focused on the short term. So we often value the economy more than, than the environment, especially if these costs are in 50 years, 100 years, uh, you know, in 100 years, we'll all basically be dead, right? So we're thinking about people um, in those future generations, right? That's number point number three there. Um, and it requires international cooperation. There's no international government that can impose Pigovian taxes or uh, quantity caps or cap and trade policies on a global scale. Um, and so we need to cooperate internationally. And, you know, given that, you know, there are the interests of the, uh, you know, countries with fossil fuels, the companies that burn the fossil fuels, um, the companies that dig the fossil fuels out of the ground, there's a lot of conflicts of interest within countries, which then boil over, you know, as conflicts of interest between countries as well. And then if we think about, you know, how much should we value the future? You know, we often discount the future in order to think about, you know, trade-offs between the present and the future. But discounting future generations doesn't really make sense in the same way, right? We don't necessarily want to discount the value of future lives compared to our present life. Um, that's not really what discounting is for. Um, and so some economists have, have made models that you know, discount the future like that and they say, oh, we shouldn't do anything. And I think that that really doesn't make sense. So one of the things that we did see is that there are win-win policies um, in you know, that second abatement cost uh, curve that we saw is that there are some policies that come with, at least in the long run, negative costs. And so we should do those right away. Um, and then we also need to think about, you know, the ones that we want to do um, that are going to cost us something, right? And hopefully if we take advantage of the, the negative cost ones, then we can also afford the, the higher cost ones as well. Um, and we do need to think about, right, how to balance things like nuclear power, which comes with some uh, risk and some, um, you know, makes people nervous. Uh, versus solar and wind, which uh, are carbon free, but, uh, you know, are not as reliable. Um, we need to think about how quickly we want to transition transportation. Uh, we want to think about what to do about agriculture, right, which is another polluter, mostly of methane, but also some of CO2. Uh, so these are all things that we need to think about from, you know, both at a social level and then at an international level. Um, we, this is just a graph again from uh, the World Resources uh, Group. And, you know, this sort of says, all right, well, you know, we're kind of here in 2020. Um, how much carbon dioxide can we get rid of through energy efficiency, uh, through low carbon energy supply, through terrestrial carbon, um, all these various things. And, and, you know, we have these opportunities to reduce the amount of carbon we put into the atmosphere by 2030, which is only 10 years away, uh, but we have to take advantage of them. And that's going to require both governments to put in policies uh, to do that um, and international cooperation. And if we think about how much it would actually cost, it's actually cheaper than we might think, right? So the net global cost, this is a McKinsey estimate, um, if we do everything that costs less than 60 euros per ton would cost us about 200 to 350 billion per year by 2030, right? So per year, that's uh, it's not nothing, but it's less than 1% of the forecasted global GDP in 2030, right? Less than 1%. And it's important to remember that one person's spending is another person's income. So if we are spending on, uh, you know, electric cars, on heat pumps, on solar panels, on wind turbines, people are earning that money, um, which is, you know, one of the reasons that these costs are lower than you might think. Um, we do need, but a lot of these, so we do require upfront investments. Um, and so McKinsey says, all right, that would, those investments uh, were, you know, would have been 530 billion euros uh, this year and 810 billion euros by 2030. But current GDP right now is 70 trillion euros. Uh, so it's still a fairly small amount and it's amount that, that is almost certainly worthwhile uh, and that we you know, need to do.